engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hello Atlanta, it is Eric Erickson here, Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. Want to be a part of the program? 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK is the number. You can get me on social media, E.W. Erickson, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. Uh, Now... The President of the United States is trying to find ways to stimulate the economy. The reason he wants to do this is because it appears there are serious warning signs that the German economy, which is the largest economy right now in Europe, has headed into recession. A recession is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative growth. The Germans have just gone through a quarter of negative growth, and the central bank in Germany is warning that they're in a second quarter of negative growth. Uh, So there are all sorts of alarm bells going off around the world about the German economy. The reason that this is so significant is because the German economy is the largest in Europe. But on top of that, uh, the German economy is the backbone of the European economy with the British planning on leaving. To get there, you need to understand Brexit. Uh, Boris Johnson is the new prime minister of Great Britain, and Boris Johnson is opposed to staying in the European Union. He was one of the people who led the effort to withdraw from the European Union and championed Brexit, and he has promised that he would do everything within his power to get Great Britain out of the European Union. And he looks set to deliver. And the way he looks set to deliver is through what's called a hard Brexit. That is that the Great Britain and the European Union do not come to an agreement on how to slowly withdraw from the EU. And instead, just automatically at the end of either this month or next month, I think, uh, the Great Britain is suddenly not in Europe. So you have Germany in a recession Suddenly, the second largest European economy is no longer part of the European economy. Well, that hurts the rest of Europe. The fallout effect is already expected to hurt Great Britain. Great Britain is already expected to be um, economically harmed by withdrawing from the European Union. The uh, British Central Bank and a, a private report leaked that was written for the Prime Minister and the Queen shows that they're expecting some economic chaos when Great Britain leaves. The spillover effect into the American economy already uh, there's an impact across the Atlantic because of the tariffs President Trump imposed. We are in a trade war with Europe to a degree, although not to the extent we are with China. The Chinese economy has already been slowing down, and there are more and more Western economists who believe that China has essentially been cooking the books and that China is, in fact, doing worse economically than it's letting on globally. So the Chinese slow down, the Hong Kong situation continues to destabilize, although there seems to be some stability there, if only because a number of people are looking at the situation in Hong Kong thinking China cannot afford economically for this situation to get out of control, nor can the Chinese afford to invade and quash the protesters because that would completely put the Chinese economy into a tailspin. But you got all of these things happening around the world. The strongest economy on planet Earth is the American economy. Also, you need to know there is another issue related to all of this, and that is Canada. Uh, Justin Trudeau, pretty boy prime minister, is in the midst of a massive scandal in Canada. And the Canadian economy is starting to slow down noticeably. So he's headed into an election cycle where he is in the midst of scandal, their economy not doing as strongly as they wanted. And now you got the situation with the United States. Tariffs are hurting American consumers and tariffs are hurting American businesses, undoubtedly, unquestionably. Uh, The president already signaling that he's going to try to avoid some tariffs that would impact Apple because it would put Apple at an unfair uh, competitive disadvantage to Samsung, which makes everything in Korea. Apple makes most everything in uh, China. So he's having to wind those down. He's having to not impose the tariffs that could impact toys at Christmas. All of these are recognitions, by the way, that the American consumer actually pays the tariffs, not the Chinese. Peter Navarro, the president's uh, advisor who convinced him to start a trade war, 
has been on TV saying that, no, no, in fact, uh, nobody pays the tariffs except the Chinese. That's not true. The American consumer pays the tariffs. It's starting to have actual measurable impact on the American economy. So the president has to do something. Uh, One of the things that the president is considering doing, and he himself confirmed this afternoon that he's doing, but that yesterday the White House denied there was even consideration of, is a payroll tax cut. Back during the Obama administration to help stimulate the economy in 2009, one of the things President Obama did was a big payroll tax cut across the board, even for the rich people, paying income taxes. And the issue here is that it would immediately impact people's take-home pay. It would immediately allow people to spend more money. This is also a double-edged sword for the president headed into an election season in that if the Democrats say, no, we're not going to allow people to have more take-home pay right now because of the debt and the deficit, well, the president can suddenly blow them up because it's pretty clear that the Democrats don't care about the debt and deficit either. It's pretty clear. Uh, So the president is trying to reach out to some moderate Democrats in key swing states to do this. But there is some pushback coming from the White House from certain Democrats you should know about. Now, while all of this other stuff is happening with the president, um, behind the scenes, the president has been reaching out, as I said, to some of these swing state Democrats. And the White House doesn't believe these guys will raise any objections to the debt and deficit. But there is some polling out there that suggests, in fact, some of these Democrats, if they stand up and look strong on the debt and deficit, which is a growing concern for moderate and independent voters, they may be able to fight the president off. So you may very well have this very interesting situation where the president of the United States is trying to do a payroll tax cut. He gets buy-in from Democratic leaders, and it's the Democratic moderates who say no because they think it'll make them look responsible. Now, these are the moderates who took Republican seats. So, for example, Lucy McBath in the 6th Congressional District here in Georgia. Uh, To my knowledge, the president has not reached out to her. He's reached out to to several people, though, from these moderate, newly elected Democrats wanting to get them on board, and they're rebuffing him. I don't know what McBath's position on this would be. But I got to think that now there are more and more reports that the economy is headed into a recession. The president obviously does not want to have this thing head into a recession, So what the president needs and wants to do is find some way to stimulate the economy, and they're going for a two-pronged approach. Prong one is trying to convince the Federal Reserve to go on and cut rates one more time. The president, of course, is already out there blaming the Federal Reserve for having raised interest rates uh, early in his term as the cause of this economic slowdown. That They're in this weird position, I should note. The White House wants to say we're not really slowing down, while also acknowledging that the Federal Reserve uh, has caused a slow, or at least claiming the Federal Reserve has caused a slowdown. So out of one side of their mouth, they say, no, no, the economy is doing strongly. And on the other side, they say, well, if it's not, it's because of the Federal Reserve, not us, not because of the tariffs, not because of the trade war. So they want the Federal Reserve to go on and lower interest rates. Again, to compensate for the fact that the Fed had raised interest rates earlier. In addition, they want to try to find a payroll tax cut solution that they can get uh, Republicans and Democrats on board to stave off. And one of the ways the president is trying to uh, make this case is to point out that if the president is in the position of saying, we need to make sure that our economy, which is strong, doesn't wind up like these other economies, and then say, well, the the Democrats won't let us do it. They did this for Obama. They won't do it for me. It makes the Democrats look like they're trying to wreck the economy to wreck the president's reelection chances. And that's something this White House is actually gambling on, that if the economy tanks, they will be able to lay the blame at the feet of Democrats. Now, unfortunately for the president, polling suggests a lot of moderate and independent voters aren't so convinced it's them as opposed to the erratic nature that of the president. And Joe Biden is actually out today with a, his first major salvo against the president of the United States and his reelection campaign. And one of the issues that Joe Biden is, is talking about is the erratic, unstable, mean-spirited nature 
of the president on the campaign trail. His ad is actually rather interesting, I think, in just the way that he is covering the issue, wants to approach it. He's trying to make the case to Democrats that, in fact, Joe Biden is the man who can beat the president. And at the same time, trying to make the case to independent, moderate voters that they need to get behind Biden in the general election to bring stability back to the country. Here's the Biden ad. We know in our bones this election is different. The stakes are higher, the threat more serious. We have to beat Donald Trump. And all the polls agree Joe Biden is the strongest Democrat to do the job. No one is more qualified. For eight years, President Obama and Vice President Biden were an administration America could be proud of. Our allies could trust and our kids could look up to. Together, they worked to save the American economy, to pass the historic Affordable Care Act, protecting over 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions. Now, Joe Biden is running for president with a plan for America's future, to build on Obamacare, not scrap it, to make a record investment in America's schools, to lead the world on climate, to rebuild our alliances. Most of all, he'll restore the soul of the nation. Battered by an erratic, vicious, bullying president, strong, Steady, stable leadership. Biden, president. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Now, no, notice the strong, it. steady, stable leadership. That's a that's a play for moderate voters. Uh, Democrats could scuttle this for Biden by not going along with the president on a payroll tax cut. If the president's able to cast the Democrats as the ones scuttling an economic spurt in order to take out the president, then suddenly it looks like it's the Democrats who are mean-spirited and petty. And so the president's got nothing to lose with doing this payroll tax. He either gets the Democrats on board and the president can take credit for leading a united front of Democrats and Republicans to save the economy, or he gets to blame the Democrats for trying to take out the economy to take him out. And that runs counter to the message Joe Biden is hoping to carry into the general election. For many of us, our blinds, whatever you use for your windows, they're just an afterthought. Window treatments, they call them. But with brand new made-to-order custom window coverings from Blinds.com, you can really transform the look and feel of your entire house. When they're right, everything in your home looks better. When they're wrong... Your house can look cheap, and when you need new blinds, there's one place to go, Blinds.com. Let me tell you about my experience with Blinds.com. I wasn't even using them as a podcast endorser. I just used them because we've got some Charleston-style faux wood shutters in our house, and in our guest bedroom, they were warping and buckling for some reason, needed to get them replaced. I didn't know where the people who built the house had got them from. I went to Blinds.com. I found some that were very, very similar, was able to measure, match them up. They sent me a sample, made sure they looked. It did it all for free. Didn't have to worry about screwing it up. They would take care of it. Sure enough, got them right. They look good. I got better blinds, and they're not warping and buckling like the ones who ever built this house did. With 15 million windows covered and over 30,000 five-star customer reviews, and I'm one of those reviews. Blinds.com is America's number one online retailer for affordable, quality, custom window coverings. Blinds.com makes the whole experience fast and easy. Every order gets free samples, free shipping, and free online design consultation. Send them a picture of your house. They send back custom recommendations from a professional for what works with your color scheme, furniture, specific rooms. They'll even send you free samples to make sure everything looks as good in person as it does online. For a limited time, My listeners get $20 off at Blinds.com when you use promo code ERIC. That's Blinds.com, promo code ERIC, E-R-I-C-K, for $20 off. You get faux wood blinds, cellular shades, roller shades, a whole lot more. Blinds.com, the promo code is ERIC, rules and restrictions apply. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Danny and Flowery Branch, well... Danny, uh, if you're listening on 95.5, the the signal out in Flowery Branch used to be where the tower is, and now it's downtown. <laughs> Good. Listen, Eric, um, I have a, uh, I agree with what you're saying about there's some risk in the Democrats um, pushing back on the tax cut. Uh, my concern, though, is though is that if we get into a negative quarter and um, there's no resolution on the China tariff front. And there's a daily uh, media barrage of um, the tariff war that wouldn't that be a little bit um, easier to uh, it's almost practically on your nose then. It seems like that'd be an easier argument to make. Yeah, listen, I I think the media is going to come after the president with everything. And I, I really, really, really do think that tariffs hurt the president because 
a, a lot of the president's advisors, including Larry Kudlow, Steve Moore, and others, all were very, very public that if the president did tariffs, it would slow the American economy down and it would cause problems globally. And all the Democrats have to do in an ad campaign is take the clips of Kudlow and Steve Moore and others uh, and run those clips as an ad and say all the president's men told the president not to do this. It would cause a recession. The president did it. And now we're in a recession. It's not our fault. It's his fault. And that, that's, that's, that will be something they can use against him. So he's got to be mindful of this, and I, I really think he needs to drop the trade war quickly. Uh, I, look, I, I realize he, he needs to come to some quick terms with China and get out of this uh, and cause a rebound in the economy. Because, again, all of his advisors were on video saying that this would cause a recession if the president started a trade war with China and Europe, and he did. And you can say, no, it's not true. You can say, no, it's not fair. You can say, no, they were wrong. But guess what? They're on video saying that this will cause a recession where it looks like we may be headed into one. Europe and China certainly are. And the Democrats can just splice those up and say, look, they told the president and he didn't listen. He's not listening to his advisors. And whether you think they were right or wrong, what do you think most people are going to think? Now, when we come back, we need to talk about prostate cancer. I want to interview a group, a new great event happening here in Atlanta you need to know about. It is Eric Erickson here, News 95.5, AM 750, WSB, I guess what, now I'm supposed to say 95.5, WSB, Atlanta's News and Talk, it's a habit. Uh, so we've got an event coming up here that you need to know about in Alpharetta, uh, November 3rd, which is a Sunday from 2 to 5, uh, a tee off to end prostate cancer. is going to be at Top Golf Alpha, uh, Alpharetta. Joining me to talk about this and to also talk about Zero, the end of prostate cancer, the leading national nonprofit with the mission to end uh, in prostate cancer is Sean Supers and... Um, Mike, I don't see your last name in the email. Let's fire you up here. Mike, what is your what is your last name? Where I don't see it any I see Cancer Warrior Mike. <laughs> it's Nuttall. N U T T A L L. There just you like go. All right. And did I just lose Sean on the phone? I think I might have just lost Sean. Here he is. Okay. No, it's a sheet. Let's see. Uh yeah, okay, Sean. Can somebody fire that up? Because I'm afraid I'll disconnect Sean on the call. All right. We're getting everybody on the phone. Okay. Sean, how are you? Welcome to the program. Oh, thanks for having us. I'm doing great. Thank you. So can you tell us about uh, the, the website is zerocancer.org and, and tell us about the program. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, Zero, of course, our mission is right there in our name. Our mission is to end prostate cancer, and we invite everybody to go to zerocancer.org to learn more. We are coming to Alpharetta, Georgia, there, to the greater Atlanta area for the TOS and prostate cancer. It is a super fun event. It is on Sunday afternoon, November 3rd, from 2 to 5 p.m., Eric, we checked. It's a Falcons football bye week. So <laughs> yeah, no I excuses. saw that in the note. <laughs> <laughs> no excuses not to come and join us. And if you've ever been to Top Golf, um, it's a super great time. You don't have to have any skill. I have no golfing skills whatsoever, and I play. Um, it's really fun. It's a social afternoon. We'll play for a few hours. Um, we'll have some speakers, some prostate cancer experts from the local Atlanta area who will be um, speaking. We'll have a uh, fajita buffet and some beer and wine and really just have a good time supporting each other so that all of the families who are impacted by prostate cancer in the greater Atlanta area know that they're not alone and that it's there for them. And, of course, as we're having a good time with each other, we'll be raising money to fuel Zero's programs. And Zero has three main areas that we focus on. We advocacy work on Capitol Hill to protect and advance prostate cancer research funding. We um, also, of course, want to be raising awareness of this issue. Uh, one in nine American men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. One in six African American men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. They're disproportionately affected, and that's one of the things that we're certainly looking into and want to find a solution to. But that particular 
audience, we want to make sure that they understand what their risks are, certainly. Because with early screening, the cancer is actually nearly 100% treatable if it's caught in its early stages. Mm -hmm. If it's caught later, it's really, really deadly and can be um, a very aggressive fight. And Mike, you're a, a prostate cancer survivor, aren't you? That's right. Yes. When when were you diagnosed, and 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 how how long ago was your treatment and all? Uh, I actually got the call, as I call it, from um, my urologist, who would be my surgeon, on January thirtieth of this year. So uh, we scheduled um, what's called radical robotic uh, prostatectomy for April fourth. So early in the morning, April fourth, I had it taken out and thrown away. <laughs> and uh, uh, recovery was uh, really pretty easy, and I got back to work in about six weeks and on with my life. But wow. it turned me into kind of a uh, activist. So I know some of the statistics that you guys sent over, so I would have them. Every 17 minutes, an American man dies of prostate cancer, 86 deaths per day, 31,620 a year, one in nine will be diagnosed in the lifetime, the third leading cause of cancer deaths in America. And then this, uh, which is for Georgia in 2019, 5,140 men are going to be diagnosed with prostate cancer this year. 920 are going to die. Now, as, as someone dealing with cancer in my family, my wife's got lung cancer and she's got a history of breast cancer. It, it does seem notable to me. And, and I think it's a fair statement. And I hear cancer advocates for other groups say that prostate cancer seems to be the one that doesn't get as much national exposure as a lot of the other cancers out there, and yet it is so common in men. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that's changing rapidly, thanks to us Zero Champions like Mike, um, and, and Zero Champions are elite volunteers for Zero who take their passion for the cause that, and for wanting to save lives and put it into action in their local communities. So Mike is a shining example of one of our newest Zero Champions. And just, you know, arranging to speak with you and your audience today, Eric, is a great example of that. Hopefully we'll reach some people with a message that will encourage them to go and get screened. There's a very simple blood test that men can take to get screened. And, uh, Mike, if I'm not mistaken, that might be how you got diagnosed. Um, oh, and Yeah, and so uh, I think that's the most important thing that we want to drive home today is that they're really easy uh, screening methods, and hopefully uh, your listeners will go get themselves checked, and uh, we might be able to save some lives here today. And they can go to zerocancer.org. They can find out about the T-Oft in prostate cancer in Alpharetta on November 3rd as well? Yep, that's correct. Great. Thank you both so much for taking time out. Uh, really do appreciate it very, very much, um, and wish we had some more time. Unfortunately, as, as Mike knows with my clock situation here in Georgia, I don't have a ton of time, but I wanted to make sure that this great event was highlighted. Uh, again, people can go to zerocancer.org. It is tee off Atlanta, tee off to end prostate cancer here in Atlanta. Now, when we come back, uh, we need to move into Atlanta news. Stacey Abrams continuing her tour of T. TV shows out there, uh, this time saying some very amazing things about voter fraud. Uh, actually, you know what? I've got time real quick. I always forget in the four o'clock hour now. I got a couple extra minutes and I want to make sure that you hear this audio from Stacey Abrams. We certainly need to talk about it. We got to do a little more as well in the uh, five o'clock hour about the 1619 project. There are more essays coming out, but I want you to listen to this from Stacey Abrams. First of all, voter fraud is a myth. It does not exist. People aren't putting on, you know, fake mustaches trying to vote twice, but voter suppression is real. We know that voter ID laws seem perfectly normal, but if you lived in Alabama when they passed their voter ID law, they also shut down two thirds, I believe, of the organizations of the DMVs in black communities so that the very people who needed those IDs would not be able to get them. If you live in Indiana, where they moved your polling place in Hamilton County outside of the bounds of the city, if you didn't have a car, you couldn't get to vote. And so what we have to recognize is that, again, these things, these laws seem very basic, but the 
application and the implication is that your vote doesn't matter. And that's why fairfight2020.org is designed to go beyond registration. So she's doing this whole tour out there now about these things, but she's out there claiming that voter fraud doesn't exist when there actually are ample cases of voter fraud historically in this country and recently in this country. One of the things that I think is worth pointing out, though, is that if we are really honest about it, there is no systematic effort in this country to suppress the vote, despite what Stacey Abrams and Democrats would have you believe. And there is no systematic effort in this country to commit voter fraud, as a lot of Republicans would have you believe. There's just not. There isn't the data to support either side on this. And both sides want to use the argument, well, but how can you tell? How do you know? Well, because we would have a very good way of a means of testing in this country in terms of ballot access, ballot security, photo ID. Photo ID actually being one of those Republican ideas the Democrats don't like claiming it suppresses the vote when in fact the data does not bear that out the data actually shows that the african-american vote rate in this country is on the increase and that's a good thing but we shouldn't be dismissive of voter fraud we shouldn't be dismissive of voter suppression but we shouldn't actually build either one of them up to be the be-all, end-all. Both sides want to blame something for their losses. And frankly, I think this is Stacey Abrams coming to terms with um, recognizing she lost fair and square and also realizing that there are a lot of white liberals who feel guilty for not supporting her the first time. And now is their time to write her checks and if she can cash in on all the guilt from a bunch of white liberals on the coast who didn't support her because they supported Beto. The phone number here is 404 wsb talk I meant to mention this the other day that the Department of Revenue has updated its rules so that you can do curbside liquor purchases at liquor stores, drive through and curbside. You know, that there are some stores now that they want to be able to do uh, curbside uh, purchasing, you know, grocery stores, you want to get beer or wine with your curbside delivery pickup at the Kroger or the Publix or whatnot. You, you can't under current rules. Well, now you can because the rules have been changed and your local liquor store can actually walk out to your car with your bottle of bourbon or scotch or whatever <laughs> but local local governments still tend to prohibit this so you gotta you gotta consult the local rules but the department of transportation or the department of transportation no no not them the department of revenue has has made it more easy um for this to be able to proceed now this is eh, i want to tell you all this, this is bizarre and it's i mean i don't want to laugh about it but at the same time geez uh Apparently, a naked dude died at the Hyatt, I think, last night, the downtown Hyatt. Uh, you know, the one with the UFO revolving restaurant on top. Apparently, was running through the hotel naked and was on the 10th floor and wanted to jump from one room to another and missed and went splat. Um, I, I, I would assume, given a story like that, there, there are drugs and alcohol involved, I would assume. I don't know. Those are the details I know. Names haven't been released. What a bizarre, bizarre thing to happen. And now I need to give you all your laugh of the day. If Doug Turnbull is listening, I hope you get your laugh out of this too, being the traffic guy. A a Georgia man has been cited for littering in Indiana by a state patrol officer for driving down the interstate and littering. Now, how on earth does an Indiana State Patrol pull over somebody from Georgia for littering on the interstate? Well, apparently the man, his wife, and child were in the car. (laughs) The child had an explosion in his diaper. They're on the interstate. The wife cleans it up, gets the diaper changed. They have nowhere to throw the diaper except out the window where it goes airborne and lands on the windshield of the state patrol that was behind them. They got pulled over. He only cited them for littering. Thank goodness. Good evening. It is Eric Erickson here, Atlanta's Evening News on WSB. The phone number 404 872 750 
WSB Talk. Uh, there is, has been some controversy here in the metro area over the ATL. I got to tell you, I I started getting text messages yesterday from people who went to the ATL, and I didn't know what the heck they were talking about. I was like, what? You went to Atlanta, and, and, and you didn't have a quorum in Atlanta? What are you talking about? I had no idea. I think I've talked to just about every single Republican who is involved now. And what is the ATL? It is the Atlanta Regional Transit Link Authority. So the R the the ATL the Atlanta Regional Transit Link Authority is composed of state legislators, county commission chairmen, and mayors uh, representing Fulton, Gwinnett, and Forsyth counties, and they met in Duluth to fill a post uh, on the Atlanta Regional Transit Link Authority. It was vacated by Board Member Marsh Anderson Bomer, who she resigned. She's taken a position with Marta. Here, listen, the the ATL, whatever you want to call it, whatever they do, here's what's important. Democrats, you got Stacey Abrams running around saying count every vote. You got Democrats running around saying count every vote. Last night, the Democrats and one Republican did not want to count every vote. Now, the Republican has a uh, valid excuse. I have talked to him, Brandon Beach, uh, who's running for Congress. He's the state senator. What happened is that every meeting of this group, the ATL, they call it, every time they meet, there are people who can't make the meeting. And so they every time have taken votes to allow votes by phone. Every time this board has met, there have been votes by phone. Every time the board has met, there has been votes by phone. In fact, they met in October. And in October, they met... And they took votes by phone because there were people who couldn't make it but took the time out of wherever they were to call in. And in fact, yesterday, there were people who called in by phone. One person was in London. One person was uh, in the ICU or the emergency room. Hang on a second. I got the details of who these people are. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes. Um One person was in London. One person was on a business trip. Another was called to the hospital suddenly because her brother was in ICU. Uh, Another member or two were also out of town but took the time to call in as well to cast this vote for District 2 for the ATL, the Atlanta Regional Transit Link Authority. And every time they've met, there have been people by phone, and every time they've met, the board has voted to accept votes by phone. The only person who has consistently opposed taking votes by phone is Brandon Beach, who's running for Congress. And last night, Brandon Beach predictably voted to oppose taking uh, phone call votes, and the reason he said to me is because he takes the time to travel all the way from Alpharetta over to Duluth and rush hour traffic to make the time because he made the commitment he thinks everybody else should as well. He doesn't like to take votes by phone understandable, a philosophical thing for him. But all of the Democrats on this group who always take phone votes and who all voted in October to take votes by phone last night said, nope, we're not going to take votes by phone. Why? Why would they do that when just last October they all voted to take votes by phone and the year before that they all voted to take votes by phone and half a year before that they all voted to take votes by phone and last night they said nope we're not going to do this this time why the ATL this board always takes votes by phone The reason they did not take votes by phone last night, the reason the Democrats on the board refused to take votes by phone last night is this. The Republicans on the board had the votes to put their preferred candidate into the spot on District 2. The Republicans had the votes, except four of their members, five of their members had to be by phone. So the Democrats on this board who say count every vote, these are po- these are Democratic politicians who, when Stacey Abrams ran for office, said count every vote. These are Democratic politicians who said do whatever you can. You, you got to count the votes, even if you think the ballot's dubious. You got to count the votes. These are Democrats 
who on multiple occasions on this very committee said, we got to count all the votes, so we need the people by phone to be counted. Last night, abandoned what they claimed were their convictions and principles because they were afraid a Republican might actually win the vote. It was real easy for them to stand on their convictions with this organization when they thought they could win. But when the Republicans had the majority of the vote to be able to put someone in, they balked. They refused to take the vote. So what happened? Here's what happened. According to the bylaws of this organization, the Atlanta Regional Transit Link Authority, again, made up of people from Fulton, Gwinnett, and Forsyth, essentially what these Democrats wanted to do was disenfranchise 10% of the metro Atlanta population. That's what it amounted to. The people they wanted to exclude from voting represented about 10% of the metro area staggering and what happened is the republicans on the committee realized that if they got up and walked there would be no quorum and the vote would not happen and so the republicans decided to stage a walkout now i'm told that brandon beach did not walk out um that he was willing to stay but then he was willing to to oppose phone votes because he always opposes phone votes. And I talked to a friend of Brandon Beach's who's in the Republican caucus who said he re- opposed phone bo- votes there as well. It's a philosophical thing for him. So I'm not going to fault him on this one. Now, some of his colleagues are, are very upset. And uh, they also think that Brandon wanted to side with the Democrats on the Democratic nominee, the former chairman of MARTA. I hadn't confirmed that. Um, I just know he voted to refuse to take phone votes. And his Republican colleagues walked out, and the group lost the quorum. Now, I want to compare and contrast Beach to the Democrats in this, in that he votes every single time to oppose taking phone votes. And he does that in the Republican caucus for the state Senate as well. The Democrats, though, they oppose constantly, or they support constantly, taking phone votes. They supported it in October. They have supported it uh, earlier last year. They supported it the year before that. They always support taking phone votes. But last night, they opposed it. Some of the Democrats in this organization are the very same Democrats who were on national TV saying count every vote for Stacey Abrams. And last night, they didn't want to count every vote, even when the people took the time to show up by phone from foreign countries to ensure that they would be there, be a responsible member of the committee who couldn't make the physical meeting, but still could take time out of an ICU visit to their brother or a trip to London, could be there to vote. And the Democrats said, you know what, we ain't, we're not into counting votes anymore we you got to be here now they changed the rules essentially because they were afraid the republicans could win now do you understand why there are a lot of republicans who really don't want to be committed to infrastructure and transit issues in the metro atlanta area when you're working with people like this why do you even want to bother Wouldn't it be nice if search engines and social media sites were unbiased platforms that didn't choose a side politically? Keep dreaming. In 2016, there were tech elite out there bragging about donating millions of dollars to Hillary. You got big tech companies that push political agendas that restrict free speech rights of conservatives. At the very same time, they're the corporations we're trusting to handle our personal data online. I don't really know that you want to give them your web history, your email metadata, or your video searches. That's why you may want to consider ExpressVPN every time you go online. Big tech companies can match your internet activity to your identity or location using your public IP address, even if you're not worried about your privacy, just the serving of ads to you. Well, when you use ExpressVPN, the tech companies can't see your IP address, so your identity is masked. It's made anonymous by secure VPN servers. Plus, ExpressVPN has the added benefit of encrypting 100% of your data to keep you safe from hackers and internet bad guys. Well, it's not complicated, even though you may think it is. ExpressVPN software takes just a minute to set up on your computer or phone. You tap one button and you're protected. So, if you believe internet data belongs to you and not to big internet companies, use ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy today. Find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash Eric. That's expressvpn.com slash Eric for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash Eric to learn more. Oh, gosh. 
Wow. Um, some, some breaking news here. Police are outside a family dollar store in DeKalb County investigating a reported stabbing. Authorities are on the scene at the store at 319 North Stone Mountain, Lithonia Road in Stone Mountain. It's unclear where the stabbing took place. The condition of the victim is unknown. Uh, WSB TV and the AJC following this story. Uh, wow. Uh, I, I have some disturbing news. I actually am kind of aggravated with this news myself. Sony Pictures has scrapped the Marvel deal for Spider-Man. They are withdrawing from their arrangement with Marvel, where Marvel produces the Spider-Man films, and they split the proceeds 50-50. They don't want to do that anymore. Um, Tom Holland's Spider-Man is the best Spider-Man. Uh, better than Tobey Maguire, certainly better than Andrew Garfield. Uh, they made him part of the Avengers. They wrapped him into the whole Marvel Universe. And now Sony is giving Marvel the middle finger and walking away from the table saying they want nothing more to do with it. Now, can you imagine, can can you just imagine poor old Peter Parker sitting there realizing he's going to yet again have another reboot where he's going to have to yet again relive Uncle Ben getting shot because the idiots at Sony screwed this up. Now, my my one caveat here is that my suspicion is the reason Sony walked away after it was very clear that Marvel was weaving the Spider-Man character further into the Marvel Universe, which Sony could profit from. But there are lots of rumblings, actually, that Sony uh, really wants to get out of the film business. And Disney can't buy Sony Pictures because it bought Fox. Uh, The Justice Department, there's no way the Justice Department would let them do this. But maybe, just maybe, Sony is walking away from the table hoping Mickey Mouse can poop out some gold to buy Peter Parker and the Spidey uh, cinematic universe from Sony, which is maybe a smart move because Sony could definitely use the money right now. But this is ridiculous that they spent all of this time weaving Spidey up. Chris Burns says Sony Pictures can suck it. I agree. I completely agree. I, I think, man, Sony stock, by the way, is tanking because of this and probably deservedly so. What a bunch of idiots. It is Eric Erickson here, Atlanta's Evening News on WSB, the phone number 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. I want to talk a little more about the 1619 Project at the New York Times and another egregious, egregious factual error from the New York Times. You might have heard Rush Limbaugh talking about this today. He actually read my piece from TheResurgent.com on his show today, and it's about the opening essay, uh, which is from Nicole Hannah-Jones. And I want to read you a very key paragraph that shapes her entire essay. Conveniently left out of our founding mythology is the fact that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare their independence from Britain was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. By 1776, Britain had grown deeply conflicted over its role in the barbaric institution that had reshaped the Western Hemisphere. In London, there were growing calls to abolish the slave trade. That would have upended the economies of the colonies in both the North and the South. The wealth and prominence that allowed Jefferson at just 33 and the other founding fathers to believe they could successfully break off from one of the mightiest empires in the world came from the dizzying profits generated in chattel slavery. In other words, we may never have revolted against Britain if the founders had not understood that slavery empowered them to do so, nor if they had not believed that independence was required in order to ensure that slavery would continue. It is not incidental that 10 of the nation's first 12 presidents were enslavers, and some might argue the nation was founded not as a democracy, but as a slaveocracy. Actually, it wasn't founded as a democracy or a slaveocracy. The founders were deeply skeptical of the idea of direct democracy. They wanted democratic institutions, but they wanted a republican form of government in which they could be skeptical of and dilute the power of the majority. 
But take the initial premise conveniently left out of our founding mythology is the fact that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare independence was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Do you know that's not true? I hope you know that is a factual error. It is a lie. It is not true. And you don't have to take my opinion for it. Let me give you the facts. The abolitionist movement started in the United States, in the American colonies, before it spread to London. That is a fact. It is an indisputed fact. Massachusetts began considering abolishing the slave trade in 1767, before London started talking about it. It voted in 1771 and 1774 to end the practice altogether, and it was the British governor general who vetoed the effort to end slavery. The Continental Congress in 1774 pledged to end the slave trade. In 1776, even the southern states, remember, here, here's one of her premises. Let me, let me read you the premise. London ending the slave trade would have upended the, colon, the economy of the colonies in both the north and the south. The wealth and prominence that allowed Jefferson and the other founders to believe they could successfully break off from one of the mightiest empires of the world came from the dizzying profits generated by chattel slavery. In 1776, this is a fact, the southern states agreed to go along with all the other colonies and abide by non-importation of slaves from abroad. They stopped the slave trade in 1776 as a way to punish the British because it was the British making money off the slave trade. But, you know, th those are just facts. Th those are facts. And, and I realize we're emotionally driven today. But what about the words of the founders? So Bernard Balin, I I've mentioned him several times. I've encouraged you all to read his book. He wrote a very influential book called The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution. He's a Harvard professor. And his book is a Pulitzer Prize winner. It's won the Bancroft Prize. It's won massive prizes. It is required reading in virtually every college in the country. And one of the things that Bernard Balin did is he actually went in and read the writings of the founders and not just of the founders. He read their private diaries. He read their letters to their wives. He read their letters to their mistresses. He read the letters of the foot soldiers. He read the letters of the merchants whose names you don't even know because they weren't even involved at the upper levels of the revolution. They they just happen to be American colonists. Let me read you what he wrote, uh, what Bernard Balin writes. He cites Thomas Jefferson, who in his letter to the delegates of Virginia to the First Continental Congress said that one of the things they needed to work on was the abolition of domestic slavery, which is a great object of desire in those colonies where it was unhappily introduced in their infant state. In 1766, 1766, Stephen Johnson of Lyme, Connecticut, the, one of the famous preachers there, preached on the general nature and consequences of enslaving measures and how the iniquity of slavery and its shocking ill effects and terrible consequences affected negatively the enslavers and the enslaved. Samuel Cook, in his Massachusetts election sermon of 1770, a famous sermon that was reproduced and spread through the colonies, argued that in tolerating slavery, quote, we the patrons of liberty have dishonored the Christian name and degraded human nature nearly to a level with the beast that perish and devoted his text to the cause of our quote unquote African slaves and the abolition of slavery. The very famous Benjamin Rush gave a sweeping condemnation of slavery in 1773, two, three years before the major movements of the revolution began. He wrote on slave keeping and said, you advocates for American liberty, you espouse the cause of humanity in general liberty, and then wrote, Against a vice that degrades human nature, the plan of liberty is of so tender a nature that it cannot thrive long in the neighborhood of slavery. Remember the eyes of all Europe are fixed upon you to preserve an asylum for freedom in this country after the last pillars of it are fallen in every quarter of the globe. Even Patrick Henry, who admitted that they could not immediately eradicate slavery, recognized they would have to do so after independence, and he said he hoped, quote, for an opportunity to be offered to abolish the lamentable evil. Now, you can say they didn't have the courage of their convictions at the time, and they didn't, because they were trying to win their own freedom from Britain. 
But don't say that one of the primary, again, a direct quote, one of the primary reasons for the colonists to declare their independence from Britain was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. That is a lie. It is a lie on the record. It is a lie in the writings. It is a lie in the actions. It is a lie from the pulpits. It is a lie from the sermons. It is a lie. And yet the New York Times wants to perpetuate this lie because they want to be race grievance mongers against Donald Trump and stir up racial animosity in this country by painting a fraudulent picture of American history where they then tell you you're either on the side of progressive socialists or you're a race, white supremacist. That's what they want to do. They're wrong for it in doing this and trying to reframe American history. And you need to know the facts because God help you, you're going to be bullied and bullied and bullied by even the media into telling you you're a racist if you think that this country is actually a good country. I'm still bummed about this whole Sony's picture thing. It just absolutely garbage that they would take Marvel off. Now, I misstated earlier. I said it was a 50-50 deal. No, what what Disney was offering was a 50-50 deal. In the past, they got 5% gross of the pictures, and they felt like they were putting in all the work, uh, doing the, the creative and everything else, and... They wanted more out of it, and Sony said, no, i got to imagine this is just a way for Sony to try to get Disney to, to pony up the money, and they're not going to do it, I wouldn't imagine. Uh, what a, just a boneheaded move by Sony. They, they are probably the worst picture studio out there. For perspective, their latest Spider-Man beat Skyfall, James Bond movie.